Good afternoon to you all. I am uh, Pier Giorgio Oliveti, the Secretary General of Citrus Law International from the Citrus Law International Headquarters in Orvieto, Italy. Welcome to the Citrus Law Academy. We have organized in the week of our uh, annual uh, General Assembly of Citrus Law uh, Academy with uh, uh, many, eight webinars in five days. And so thanks to the distinguished speakers who joined to this webinar dedicated to the slow mm. urbanism. You know uh, all that the recent pandemic has shown everyone more than ever in the past the value of the new urban planning based on good living, easy living and the needs of inhabitants. Chita's law has always focused on social cohesion, sustainability, of course, and sense of the limits. Uh, how do you plan a city of good living or a Chita's law? Speaking of, uh, for example, interplay, interplay how to moderate the irregular spread of the city sprawl in the rural area, coastal or mountain space. Connection, innovation, but with a sense of limits and having social and environmental sustainability as a priority. This in short, and I would uh, to thanks so much, Professor Giuseppe Roma. Giuseppe Roma is the coordinator of our Cittadino International Scientific Committee, and he will coordinate uh, the whole uh, webinar from uh, this moment. I thanks. Uh, all uh, protagonists, the Professor Thomas Angotti, New York University, the Professor Andreas Kipar, landscape architect, Professor Agnieszka Jaftsan, Polish Chitoslo Scientific Committee, difficult uh, your surname to pronounce, sorry, and Professor Francesco Cellini, President of Academy, prestigious Academy of San Luca, and not last, absolutely, Paul Knox, a good friend of my Cheetos Law Scientific Committee of Cheetos Law from many years, Virginia Polytechnic. Remember that all relationship, relations or report or PDF or PPT from the speakers will be available on the academy folder at the end of the week of our academy in the Cheetos Law website. Good job, uh, everyone. OK. Good morning, because for somebody this, this morning, good afternoon and good evening to all mm -hmm. our guests. <clears throat> I personally want uh, to uh, say a very uh, huge thank to all the well-known experts, designers, architects, friends, urban planners, who have agreed to help us better define how to plan our Cheetah's law and how the movement can contribute to the future of the city. Uh, they will intervene in the webinar in order first Tom Mangotti, uh, Professor Cellini, architect Keeper, Professor Agnieszka, I prefer the name, and uh, the friend and member of the of, of scientific committee, Professor Knox. Uh, let me introduce the, the theme, uh, also with some uh, it's right, please, if you want to put the first one. We are an, as an association of local authorities, of mayors who operate in all continents in different economic and social and political situations. 
we cannot limit ourselves to stating problems that we must develop a common orientation on how to solve them. We place ourselves with a specific slow philosophy in the field of sustainability, environmental and social solidarity. And we have defined a general model of a city, but we also need to identify the most appropriate urban planning tools. Urbanization historically transforms all aspects of society and landscape, causing changes to biodiversity and affecting primary resources such as air or water. Yet living together in a confined space is the solution that humanity has given itself to the search for security and freedom in individual choices to use the agglomeration economy <laughs> and increase participation in war. It remains a prerogative of the human species to bring together so many people in a relatively small place which the ancient Romans identified as citizens, regardless of origin or race. It is, however, a mechanism that has generated many inequalities, discrimination, and caused great damage to the environment. There are cities that show a high level of planning, while others seems more the product of spontaneous evolution. Organizing with urban planning the availability of services to citizens, pay attention to the quality of architecture must be one of the distinctive features of Chittas. To give shape to the city since ancient time have been formulated urban theories, models of ideal cities utopian projects of urban societies. Uh, if, se mettiamo la prima diapositiva. See here some example. Look clockwise. The Vitruvius architect, no, quella precedente. Esatto. Vitruvius, architect of the first century Anno Domini, identify a polygonal city with a square, square right in the middle and radial streets that reach the doors oriented with prevailing winds to improve urban hygiene. The classical cities then serves as a reference for the city of the Renaissance. With the development of industry and commerce is the third is here. <clears throat> the city grows inside, and since the beginning of the 20th century, a way has been sought to make this excessive concentration of factories and inhabitants more human. This is the project, you know, of Tony Garnier. The futuristic city of the early 1900s is designed on several overlapping floors and enhance the possibility of technologies to apply to urban planning. Finally, the models still present in contemporary urban culture, I think are two. That of Franklin Lloyd Wright for a wet sprayed city with single family home with workplaces and services rich bowl from 10 to 14 minutes by car or any individual means. Recently picked up in a new form by Carlos Moreno of Sorbonne in Paris with the city in 15 minutes. The other model is here, this one. This is the Ville Radius, Radius of Le Corbusier has been successful so far that's of high density divided by functions living working consuming 
consumption, having fun. The megalopolis, this is the result, became finally the place of the social inequalities of the peripheral ghetto of pollution. Eh, la prossima. <clears throat> However, the idea of a more human urbanism, more respectful of nature and the environment, has always remained alive. If you look this part of the, the slide, this remember the garden city of Howard, a network of cities of no more than 35,000 inhabitants. You know that Chittas Law are a city town of only at maximum 15,000 inhabitants. And so this idea now we can uh, expand with the more recent model of uh, a kind of eco-friendly town, the 15 minute city. You know that with the, we experimented during pandemic, smart walking, stay at home and work, and the, the neighbor life caused by restrictions. But I don't know, this is one of the theme that I would like to discuss with you, because uh, this idea, uh, I think, uh, must be developed, creating more uh, hybrid communities, not only small communities in the, in the proximity only, but something that can make together the virtual relationship given by internet, social media and so forth, and the uh, real and uh, uh, physical relationship. So I think this uh, hypothesis that is the, the newest one uh, remain uh, a good hypothesis, but we can see how to connect proximity networks to major cultural creative and ecological flows. La prossima diapositiva. La prossima, per favore. La, met la mettiamo in grande, se non si... Eh. And in this uh, model of... Uh, I think Paris is the, the, the city that is uh, implementing the, the theory. Uh, this is Rue de Rivoli. Uh, maybe you know very well where uh, uh, where is this street in Paris? It's, it's, it's close to Bourg. It's in between, uh, uh, in the center of Paris. And now, after the election for the second time of the, the mayor, uh, Hidalgo, uh, is uh, traffic free. I, I, I remember, uh, was a very congestionated street. So the idea is going ahead, Barcelona, uh, we collaborated also uh, with Barcelona to make a huge city part of 55 uh, small city around the local market of the neighborhood. But we have other, other possible examples. So it's not an utopia, it's something that is going ahead, but we have discussed. Avanti la prossima. Ora, here are the, the final. So, tower as law urbanism is necessary for Chita's law to elaborate an autonomous thought about urban planning. Because we have idea and we have a model for many things how to, to, to share uh, the, the relationship uh, 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 with, with the natural space the, the rural area, the conviviality, a cozy community, uh, energy. We, we, we have many, many ideas and models, but I think we have to think uh, more uh, uh, around a, a possible process of urban planning. Uh, 
there are major questions that you know very well, climate change, health, work, growth of inequalities. But there are specific questions. How to, to reconcile urban and natural spaces? How to design green and city? We have one of the major European uh, uh, landscape architects like, like Andreas Kipa with many examples of new way to, to think about green in the city. The role of architecture, Francesco Cellini uh, was dean of the Faculty of Architecture of Rome and is designer. Uh, maybe he can say many things about this point. How can we avoid the speculative interest giving priorities to community interest? That's a more economical uh, problem that urban planning uh, is, uh, uh, has a role in, uh, to regulate this, uh, this question. The role of heritage, how improve social cohesion, how to involve citizen in planning. So, and the last two slides, please Avanti. So, I think that we have to pay, to, to pay attention to the governance. Uh, the urban planning has to be a continuous process of safeguarding the territory and urban regeneration to reduce consumption of green feed to zero. We have regenerated and not expand the, the, the city, the small city, the medium-sized city, and the, and, and the huge city. A plan aimed to reduction building speculation and parasitic urban rents, clear indication on infrastructural networks. Our plan, we have to say, the infrastructural networks for sustainable mobility, energy based on renewable sources, waste recycling, Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi in all the city and telematic connection. If we look at small town as Chita's law are, maybe in the rural areas, far from the big center, we can put in, the, in, the, in a, a, a vital situation, if it's possible to be connected uh, all over the world, like we are now doing, staying in New York, in Rome, uh, in Orvier. The involvement of the community in strategic choice and transparencies of operational decision. So this is the part of the political part of planning. And in the end, l'ultima, in the end, the, the contents of uh, the plan and uh, uh, la prossima, <clears throat> we have uh, to, to understand how a plan for Chita's law can uh, be in, uh, uh, in contact with the, the wider natural system, if you want also the regional system. We are not isolated. The land, landscape is something that goes everywhere and we have to locate it, our city in a wider system, mostly a wider natural system. We have to develop more innovation in the building construction industry with ecological materials, with the saving in energy, because we are building in an in a innovative way. And the architecture, the beauty of the city, we have to control how the quality of architecture for new buildings in our city and how to be to harmonize with the pre-existing fabric of the city. The production of uh, uh, energy by renewable sources is something that could be distributed and not only something uh, uh, far from each citizen. And in the end, the urban green, a system that is uh, one of the core system of our city. How 
to, to make an urban green for the enjoyment of the citizen, for educating the young generation, for uh, let people stay outdoor with their many activities. In the end, the, the tangible, intangible cultural heritage, how put together with the idea of the future, the plan of future. I, 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 I have um, uh, I finish here, uh, and uh, uh, I will open the floor uh, first to Tom Angotti. Tom Angotti, um, I say, is uh, is uh, professor emeritus emeritus in urban policy and planning at Hunter College of City University, but is a very a friend of very long uh, period for me when he was uh, at uh, Columbia University with Peter Marcuse, I remember, we had some course together. So, Tom, please, the floor is uh, up you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you for this invitation, um, Giuseppe and it's a, an honor to speak to the Chita Slow uh, conference. As Giuseppe said, I am an urbanist. I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer. Um, my theory and practice comes out of community planning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that with um, my base, New York City where I was born and where I have come back to, to teach and to practice as a community planner. Uh, although I did serve my time in the New York City Department of City Planning, which may someday discover the benefits of planning, but right now um, does not advocate for planning. Uh, just to begin to give you an idea, last year, just before the pandemic, now a year and a half ago, there was legislation. New York City has never had a comprehensive plan. It's the only major city in the United States that has never had a comprehensive plan. So after many years of uh, doing community plans, we have over a hundred of them, many more than the city planning department has even thought of. Um, after more than a, a hundred community plans, we launched a campaign to force the city to develop comprehensive planning as a regular practice, just to get the practice legitimized. And I testified before the city council with the uh, director of the city planning department who responded to my support of the legislation by saying city, uh, uh, comprehensive planning is a waste of time. So you begin to understand the ideological and political barriers in this large city, 20 million people in the metropolitan region, 8 million people within the city of New York, and no comprehensive planning. Uh, so uh, I came to this, though, this, this um, appreciation for planning through community movements, uh, through the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s where neighborhoods and communities organized against the destruction of their neighborhoods by a federal urban renewal program that dis displaced large numbers of African-Americans, uh, Latinos. Uh, we called it um, urban removal and not, or Negro removal, not urban renewal. And that is where my generation of urban planners became community planners, first of all. Uh, it was in an effort 
to stop the destruction of neighborhoods and to advocate for their development and growth. So um, I wrote a book, New York for Sale, um, that describes the community planning movement that talks about the more than 100 community plans uh, and advocated for changes in city policy, which have yet to occur. Um, a more recent book uh, that I edited was called Zoned Out, because the city's main tool for planning is zoning and is the excuse for not doing planning because zoning changes occur on a project by project basis and do not require government or communities to consider what really matters to them, the quality of life, how development is going to improve or not, uh, the issues and, and the problems that communities face. Um, so New York City for me is a living example of how scale matters that and how important it is to operate at different scales at the neighborhood community scale. We have over 300 neighborhoods in New York City and many of them formed around ethnic enclaves. New York City is also one of the most segregated cities in the world by race. And um, so the question of racial justice is interwoven with the effort to stop displacement of communities of color. And out in the forefront of the fight for improved quality of life and environment in New York City has been the civil rights movement, which has now taken shape in the form of the environmental justice movement. How did the environmental justice movement come about? It came about when um, you had the concentration of noxious polluting facilities in low income neighborhoods, which were invariably uh, communities of color, uh, African-American, Caribbean, Puerto Rican, and people organized to improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods. But what is the first obstacle that emerges? Once you start planning new amenities, parks, green spaces, community gardens, the value of land goes up. And that encourages speculators to enter and buy up the land, displace people, so that the benefits accrue to new development and, and uh, result in the displacement of the existing population. So the environmental justice movement, I'll give you some of the examples of slow uh, planning and um, that has come out of this, uh, this recent movement. Distributed energy. So we have neighborhoods who have, that have hosted, um, and these are low income neighborhoods where land values are low. Uh, they've hosted polluting energy facilities. And there's no secret that the alternative, which is distributed energy, smaller, uh, uh, energy, local energy production comes out of, of neighborhoods who realize that once the quality, one, once the polluting plants are, leave, land values go up and they will be forced to leave because there are no protections for property owners, small property owners, homeowners, or for tenants and they are history. And so uh, the, um, perhaps you've heard about Black Lives Matter and the recent um, demonstrations against policing, aggressive policing in communities of color. 
it should be no surprise that the alternative now under discussion as we are in the mayoral campaign is community policing, local uh, efforts to improve the quality of life, not simply sending armed armies of um, police into neighborhoods that have never seen them as friendly. And so um, waste management is another one of the things that is coming out of our community movements. A uh, hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago, New York, like so many major cities, adopted um, garbage disposal as the solution to the waste problem. Just put it in a truck and take it out somewhere and get rid of it. The environmental justice movement is calling for composting, obligatory composting within neighborhoods, uh, calling for a reduction of waste, the use of plastics, um, and we, New York just uh, uh, last year passed a bill that outlaws the use of plastic uh, bags in supermarkets. Um, but it's a very, and it's a very slow process, but it's very clear that those neighborhoods that have been the dumping grounds where garbage tends to wind up on the streets are the ones advocating for more sustainable uh, waste management system. Food production. We have a tremendous community garden movement in New York City. Now this did not come about by, uh, as a result of food lovers getting together and creating their little boutique gardens. It came about during a period of massive land abandonment in the 1970s, 1980s in New York City, where vast parcels of land in low-income communities um, were left open and people spontaneously started to garden. And when the city tried to, um, and, and much, of, much of that, those gardens were on city owned land because the city became the owner of default when private owners abandoned the city. Uh, but then in the 1980s, um, city government said, we want that land back because it'll be uh, good for uh, creating new development, um, new investment, and the gardeners fought, fought back. And we won, mostly. We lost a number of gardens, but we now have uh, three major community land trusts in New York City uh, to that are aimed at preserving these gardens. And they are active gardens. We also have a number of um, small private boutique gardens that produce nothing but high value herbs. But it is amazing to see um, how much food is being produced. I recently wrote an article, however, uh, qualifying my, um, my pleasure with this movement by saying, we'll never produce enough food for a city of 8 million people within the boundaries of the city of New York. Um, it's not realistic, uh, but we can create a better understanding among our population about the relationship between food, health, and the earth. And uh, uh, we are currently engaged in a massive re-education campaign because, and I'm a community gardener, I must, must confess, because we discover very quickly that most of the land in the city is polluted by lead. That resulted from uh, over 60 years of lead, leaded gasoline 
in the city. So the first thing you find out is that you have to replace the soil if you want to produce healthy food. And, um, and, and that's a, an environmental awakening, important for urban dwellers. And um, um, the environmental justice movement is out in front of that. The other grand area of infrastructure where the um, slow city can inform a reshaping of policy is transportation, of course. We have the largest mass transit system in the United States, one of the largest in, in the world. And it was first called rapid transit. We should abolish that term rapid and we should call it transportation. Some transportation needs to be rapid, but most transportation needs to be slow. And um, so the uh, movements to make safe bicycling, uh, New York is really behind so many European cities, but uh, that movement is, is slowly moving forward. And um, also an, uh, the uh, effort to reshape um, the streets system. 25% of the land in the city are streets and sidewalks. And most of that land is monopolized by cars and trucks. And too often it monopolizes public space in our neighborhoods. It's no secret that even those who are opposed to comprehensive planning because of its past mistakes and errors and because it interferes with the real estate market, those, even they are calling for a redesign of the street network to make it more friendly to people who live and work in neighborhoods. So neighborhoods and communities are slowly making inroads into this um, environment that was created by real estate and that forever has been run by a growth machine that says the only way we can improve anything is by building more. Um, that growth machine has stalled now and the pandemic has helped people to realize its inequalities and imbalances. We have uh, $30 million condos going vacant uh, because people uh, are buying properties on Caribbean islands instead of um, being in New York City. We have an enormous amount of wasted space. Uh, mega projects under that are being designed and some like the most recent one in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, half empty. Um, the other major challenge of slow planning in New York City is preservation. For too long, preservation has been about building preservation and not about neighborhood preservation, community preservation. Uh, we're fighting not only to have physical landmarks, but cultural landmarks. So much of the rich history of our ethnic uh, neighborhoods from Harlem to East New York uh, is built around ethnic enclaves who bring with them a rich history and imprint it on the physical city. How do we save that? And especially how do you save it if it's not designed by a star architect, if it's not um, uh, uh, housed in a um, 
beautiful building. Uh, so uh, cultural landmarking is very much a part of um, building the slow city. And I guess fi the final uh, uh, conclusion I, I would make is that here we have, well, I, I'm a longtime advocate of the benefits of large scale metropolis, which dominate the urban environment globally. But that doesn't mean we can't be advocates for small scale neighborhood community planning, sustainable uh, uh, planning. And in fact, the two are, need each other because uh, the majority of the world's population now lives in metropolitan regions around the world. How do we go back to and go forward to more sustainable, equitable uh, communities? And I think slow planning, uh, and, and I'll just close with my, my final um, speech on slow planning, uh, because I get asked all the time by neighborhoods and communities, will you come work with us on a community plan? Uh, and they wanna finish it in six months. And I say, no, the process has to be an extended process you have to invest time and effort. One of the first things we always find out in doing community planning is how divided, how, how many differences there are in communities. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And this is an opportunity to learn how to deal with difference between genders, between races, ethnicities, ages, this is a tremendous opportunity. My colleagues in urban planning are teaching their students the wrong thing, which is here's how you can do a plan in six months. You organize these sessions, you uh, reach consensus, you develop proposals and you present it. That isn't deep planning. That isn't democratic planning. Uh, because it doesn't account for difference. And so that's my, that's my message in a city and a metropolitan region, which has so many differences uh, that we now see after the rise of Black Lives Matter uh, coming to the fore in local politics. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Tom. Many the many interesting point uh, and, the, and the last one planning is a process because uh, it's important to make uh, a, a sort of uh, process uh, with the community and the community planning is not another kind of planning it is the way in which a community can design the future and also, I appreciated a lot your idea of preservation of cultural identity, a cultural community. So I, I, I will I will give the floor to to Francesco Cellini. Uh, he, he will uh, talk, uh, I think, about uh, the heritage and how to plan a city with a big heritage like Rome. Francesco Cellini, uh, as I said, is the president of Academy mm. uh, of San Luca that was founded in uh, 1593, I think, by Roman artists. Francesco, a te la parola. Sì, potrei avere la traduzione in inglese? Uh, yes, uh, it's asking for the English translation. Sì, 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 parla in italiano. Ah, okay. Allora, io uh, ho pensato di contribuire... I have uh, uh, thought to uh, make a contribution only from one point of view, through some examples. The uh, point of view of heritage is a very used uh, uh, term, the entire uh, urban planning um, uh, world and universe, and architects are very uh, uh, attentive for this uh, concept. I uh, wanted to talk about the significance, the, the meaning of this world. Word. 
I would like to share my presentation and I ask just a moment. I would like to share my screen. Spero che vediate lo schermo. I hope you see my screen. E, con, e condiviso lo schermo? Lo vediamo, sì, grazie, grazie mille. Yes. Allora, We can see it. So the World Heritage according to uh, who and uh, how is it studied and uh, told, it uh, has a different meaning. Uh, in particular, in Italy, heritage is one of the crucial aspects of uh, all uh, the uh, safeguard activities of um, authorities and um, bodies uh, that uh, care about the protection of uh, the heritage. Their approach to this uh, concept regards the scientific and uh, um, knowledge about the term and it builds our idea of history and obviously from this point of view their uh, approach to this uh, uh, and their point of view is uh, um, controversial so for the communities is it the same uh, same thing I make an example. In our country that is full of history, we could have find some archaeological site that is not studied and is uh, uh, then excavated and is uh, uh, analyzed. It is not uh, uh, given for this kind of the fact that for the people living in the place, this is significant. It could, could be that the uh, presence of this uh, uh, site is very important for the national uh, culture, but for the local community, it has no significance or it appears like uh, an option uh, for uh, tourism attraction. In my experience, I see that communities have uh, a strong sense of heritage of uh, their identity and not always this coincides with the, the idea of uh, safeguard. Sometimes it's something unexpected. I, I would uh, like to show you some examples that are, uh, come from my uh, professional experience and they are very close to the idea of Cheetah's Law or a smaller, um, center in that is Baschi in Umbria. The others are referred to the city of Rome and then Istanbul, that is a um, uh, uh, metropolis. Let's look at Baschi. This is uh, a place where I have uh, worked a lot. I have made some planning for uh, minor um, works. I have uh, made some correction to this square. Baschi is a very small uh, uh, village. It is a community in the real sense. I have uh, perceived that we didn't uh, need any uh, dialogue uh, with the community because just uh, discussing with the major, after a few seconds, I was discussing also uh, about um, the uh, wishes and perspective of the entire community. So my job was uh, led by this uh, uh, mission, this, uh, uh, the fact that the, the ideas were very clear. It was, it was very clear that their sense of identity was curious and uh, unexpected. 
Basque is very um, close to Orvieto, I think not mm, even five kilometers from that place, but they feel themselves very far from uh, uh, that uh, center. Their identity is based uh, on the geological confirmation of their territory. Their territory is separated by the uh, river or the bed of the river, uh, uh, Tiber. There is a very small bed and we have a peculiarity that is uh, made of volcanic stone. We have uh, the material of construction uh, of the city is uh, uh, tough, so they have uh, 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 calcareous substrate, and you can see the color is uh, uh, white gray. So even if paradoxically, um, we have a separation, a net separation of, of their identity in staying in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a territory that is um, uh, very different from a telluric point of, vi of view. Let's look at the square. This is the only common place, the, the larger square of the place. It's very large. And uh, you can uh, uh, go to the uh, town hall there. And is uh, divided into three areas. We have uh, the uh, nucleus, historical center, this area of the square, and three, we have the uh, modern expansion. Even if uh, there are few inhabitants, we have modern expansion due to the fact that they wanted uh, bigger houses with garden, with garage. Uh, and so they are all. Uh, 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 they all have one or two um, houses in uh, different areas. So the idea was to uh, rearrange this square. So in the past, the, the square was void and was uh, uh, really, uh, was very, really ugly. Uh, so it was too big compared to the density of the historical village. But this is fundamental because this was not just a public place of uh, a meeting point, but it's also the place of the market. And if you think about that, this is the place where this smaller village was at a dialogue with the external world, with an exchange of goods, uh, agricultural goods with the, with the rest of the territory. There was a trade point and is uh, still today uh, um, a trade point. So the weekly market, it is no more uh, a place where you, you, you sell and buy animals, but it continues to be one of the main places for the activities of the village. So we had uh, a market that was really um, a, a market that is uh, uh, exactly um, uh, the right one to find its place in a, a so large square. So this ugliness of the square um, surprised me because at the moment the, the square it was totally different. In the 50s, uh, a major that had good intentions, decided that this void square uh, would um, uh, deserve some uh, uh, trees, but, um, but maritime pine trees are not exactly what is uh, recommended. So you can see that those trees have grown uh, too much and they created a lot of damages with movements of the soil 
invasion of roots into the foundations of the houses, so creating issues and uh, also a climate uh, that was not so uh, um, pleasant. So with the humidity and so the effect was not the best. Uh, so winter is very cold there. So from a climate point of view, it, this was not so uh, pleasant as, uh, um, as arrangement. You would remain uh, surprised by the operation that I had to to carry out. Um, it, it was uh, outside of the idea of an approach with nature. So we had to eliminate those uh, trees and uh, get back to the previous stage. And then we had uh, an open space, uh, a public space. We uh, uh, have cars, but such um, invasive trees uh, were not the best choice. So the heritage for them was to go back to the, the, the square that was void. This is what they wanted. And they, was, uh, they, they were saying that uh, collectively, the new place, the new square has taken back some very important functions. And we have uh, expanded the uh, trade and uh, uh, business activities that were there. And we had different uh, um, uh, condition of the uh, flats that were there. So, so they were uh, in, in, in not inhabited. So many people get got back to the those flats, and so you can see that the square now is clean uh, as uh, neat. So what I did was something irritual. I have demolished some trees, and I did that with great hesitation. But uh, indeed, I have given back an identity to this village. Uh, to his play, its places, uh, the need to have uh, consistent places with the general sense of, uh, of the square. This uh, operation was uh, at the limit, but this is uh, showing uh, uh, very uh, strongly the fact that this is not an, a scientific approach. So, uh, uh, consider as a, a testimony of an historical aspect that was documented, but this is a link to our uh, living condition and the success, success of this square is uh, uh, wonderful. We, we had some photos when this uh, square was opened and this um, square uh, become back, uh, became back the center of the village. So, let, uh, so to go back to the previous uh, uh, idea of heritage is what you feel uh, within yourself. The fact that you contribute to the awareness of oneself, of the collective uh, uh, community, to become uh, uh, an identity in uh, uh, a sense. Vice versa, a, a good, a work, Oh, and heritage can remain there as separate from our life and simply remain as an, an, ex an external good that is does not interact with the uh, urban planning or the village or urban life. Let's uh, pass to the uh, city of Rome. The situation was totally different. We have to say that in Rome, it's really difficult to make some comparisons uh, with the research that you do for smaller towns because Rome is not a small town. In the in the city center, it's really hard to to think in terms of community because we have many communities that use the city. This is uh, uh, the area of. Um, San uh, Paul outside the wall, and I was asked to uh, reorganize this uh, place. We have um, made the right choice. Uh, 
uh, reasonable choice. We have eliminated uh, a great amount, a couple of hectares of soil that was used by cars uselessly and was uh, destined to ha uh, cars. You see, so you see this uh, a labyrinth of um, around um, about. And we have given back to the people a lot of green areas. And I start, uh, and we have recreated an, an, a garden that was there uh, already. And then we had a park that was useless. We have uh, recreated uh, a, a, a street that was uh, before a kind of uh, web uh, of uh, uh, of other uh, streets. So we have a reference uh, of this place with uh, a greater uh, community of uh, believers uh, of the Catholic Church. This is one of the seven uh, basilicas. And this is a place of the jubileum of 2000. So we had uh, some uh, religious tourism, religious tourism, and uh, had some uh, uh, tourism from uh, uh, at international level. So we have then uh, a, co a community, uh, a local community that is linked to the context uh, be, be, be underneath this uh, uh, line that you cannot see. Uh, there is the University of Rome. So this was the place where students could make a, a break. And this is... Uh, very used by them. So you could see that many students were there resting or playing. And it is also a public garden, not just uh, for the ones who are, live there, but, be, but also people that are on the other side of the river, because this is uh, a very densely populated neighborhood and they had not much uh, green areas so it is used by mothers families children that live uh, uh, far away so while in the example of basque the square was uh, uh, corresponded with the uh, community here you cannot see you cannot identify uh, the uh, proximity, so the community that comes to visit uh, um, uh, church is a, is a far um, community. The other community of the students uh, of the university is, is there, but then we have a, a semi-proximal uh, community of uh, children and families. So having said that, I wanted to uh, stress the fact that, uh, that my work was very simple. I have, uh, I based on, I based my work on uh, uh, the historical importance of this building and we, we had to uh, respect it and consolidate it. You see also the use of the space, people that go to visit the church always with this relationship with the church. But I did something that in, in doing that uh, work, I discovered that there was a, a secret in this area. Secret is intended as, you can see this street. Uh, this uh, was a very ancient uh, Roman um, uh, a Roman road, uh, uh, Roma Stienza, and uh, they uh, were, uh, those uh, areas were dedicated to, uh, to, uh, to graves of uh, great families. Uh, they were uh, big graves. Uh, and uh, this street was uh, the street of the harbor and we had many graves and 
they were not uh, linked to bigger families, but to the most uh, humble families of, uh, of the city. So by uh, creating this pavement that had uh, changed uh, um, the uh, pavement of only a few centimeters, I have discovered that this entire uh, area was a, a cemetery, a Paleo-Christian cemetery, a stratification of uh, graves. And uh, you see that there is uh, a, uh, an agglomeration of those uh, graves. Um, everything is burial. You can see those uh, irregular lines. They are uh, benches that are designed by me. They, they are not geometrical. This is not consistent with the project, but they are there because uh, there, there were some walls of uh, properties of the 16th century. So if you have uh, a pavement that is uh, uh, 20 uh, centimeters higher, you could find uh, those. Um, and this was um, a kind of respect for the heritage. Uh, this is not written uh, anywhere, but I thought that a new uh, line of uh, concrete could not be there. And the only way was to make it on a foundation that uh, already uh, desecrated those graves. This uh, was uh, a popular belief. And uh, this is one of the um, ways where this project failed because we were not able to tell to everybody, to uh, all of the people that uh, across this place, so students after an exam, the mothers uh, with the children playing on the ground. Uh, for me, it was uh, uh, absurd to not uh, having been able to, to tell about this history. I tried to eliminate uh, the bushes and uh, uh, short uh, elements and uh, make everything transparent. You are in a point and you can see far away. There is no sense of uh, uh, threat of uh, people that can hide behind something. This is uh, a very wide vision. This is one of the requirements of a public space. And all of the services, you can see this white line of specific services, hygienic services, a place, playground for the children are collected in a space. I do not want to go in detail uh, about a project, but there is a, a data that was um, uh, retrieved, the dignity of uh, a place around an historical place. And this is the beauty of an architect. And this, uh, and in this we were successful then to retrieve a place in terms of its use. Uh, it should be flexible, organized, uh, well organized. And uh, in some way we, we did um, manage that. But it did, we did not um, be, we weren't successful in uh, allowing people to move in uh, a place where we have uh, thousands of thousands and thousands of uh, buried people. The only uh, point is uh, around uh, an ancient place of uh, graves. I have created a cover. A, a, a kind of roof and I uh, tried to organize it um, with this arc. This is a, a, a burial sign as a re respect sign for those uh, uh, structures. They are very small graves. They have really re re small 
dimension. So one meter, one meter and 20 centimeters. So they simulate a grape, but in a smaller scale, like uh, dolls houses. And they are so tender. You see those smaller grapes, so everything is so small. You have 20 centimeters. Uh, uh, they, they mentioned we have uh, uh, couples, uh, uh, wife and husband together. And this was so intriguing that I wanted to make it become the protagonist of this place, of this square, but I didn't manage. Because this is uh, an, a scientific aspect, so the heritage is uh, huge and so important. And this is one of the paradoxes. How do you look at the heritage? From my point of view, walking on this uh, square dedicated to the graves of the uh, poor classes uh, since the ancient times until the 15th century, we had uh, graves of people that died of pest. We have the grave of some pole, and then around we all, all of those uh, poor people of all religions that have been uh, buried there. This, this uh, was the occasion to give just a sign moving the attention of the citizens on something that is heritage. But the authority, the safeguarding authority uh, poses a problem. We have a conflict between the use and degradation that has to be uh, protected. So the authority gave me this uh, job and uh, vice versa it is very uh, rare for me to go and visit this place another topic regarding the heritage and uh, uh, for me this is very interesting and it, it is uh, another aspect of uh, austerity that uh, of the augustus um uh, site this this has different layers. We have the grave of uh, Augustus and its family. We have uh, a huge uh, place in uh, the country. We had uh, bigger uh, uh, rural areas. So, so it was the, a sign of power, a, a big uh, tumulus then uh, the city is growing around it in uh, every uh, stage, uh, me medieval castle, and then in the uh, uh, 14th century, we have the, the other city, the other roads around it. We had speculative city, and then uh, the city grows in beauty, and then we had a real texture around it. We have a web you see the uh, uh, reproduction in scale. We have a public space with shows. Um, uh, initially, it was a private garden, and then it became uh, a place of shows of various kind. Uh, then we had uh, shows of the 17th century with fire, then it was covered in one way, then in another way, then it becomes uh, an auditorium of the city and uh, the city was compact. We had this uh, public building for uh, 5,000 people, concerts. And for many people, this was very significant. Uh, not for me, I was there when uh, 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 everything was already demolished, but for my uh, friend, for example, this is exactly how he uh, recalled it. The people went there to listen to music and concerts. 
then we had this labyrinth of uh, houses and uh, small uh, uh, streets. Then we had fascism, where this place became uh, a scenographic place. Then uh, we had the war. After the war, then we had the demolition. And in the end, in the 50s, until uh, recent years, we have this uh, ruin that is inaccessible. It's very fascinating, but from the outside, it looks like a mountain of walls with uh, trees uh, that have grown uh, too much and an area that was excavated, then a parking place. Um, we are, I wanted to show you that the project aimed at something. You have to consider that in the area that was uh, divided by fascism, we had uh, layers of many different things. We, you see many, many plants. Uh, in gray, you, you see the Roman parts and then all of the layers, um, streets, sewages, uh, buildings of the various uh, ages, uh, everything that was one on, uh, on the other. So the project aims at uh, giving back a green area to the city and uh, a series of ramps that leads you to the initial uh, site. So we have the Augustus Foundation uh, and uh, uh, we try to keep everything that was there. You can see from the uh, design, you have residuals of every kind, pavement of the Adrian age um, of the fourth uh, of the fifth um, century, places where there are um, obelisks. Uh, so the places try to uh, tell about its history. We have, uh, we wanted to fight with uh, the safeguarding authorities because they want um, that if there is uh, some uh, Domitiano um, ruins, they have to be preserved. But until now, we have uh, seen uh, so they want uh, this place to be um, something that the Romans can uh, work on. So through uh, stairs, so they, they could look on the Adriano's uh, area and the walls, they should uh, be able to read the various layers and everything that happened. Um, that can still be retrieved. So places where there are obelisks uh, so that the citizens can see uh, where these obelisks uh, went uh, now are now placed. Uh, so this is uh, education. And of course, <laughs> unfortunately, we don't have so much time. So to conclude, the only uh, trick that I tried to use was to transform this place in uh, a place that uh, is linked to the city in a lively way so that the people can uh, use it uh, for to go to other places. Uh, also, Uh, creating an info point and a bar so that people can stay there. This is another mix that I would suggest. I would suggest uh, archaeologists to, to make a, a bar that is pleasant on a site that is uh, that has an ancient pavement. This is uh, it. Uh, 
I don't want to show you Istanbul because the, this is the same concept. So heritage is a very delicate aspect that has to be dealt with trying to uh, find in the communities and the users of uh, public space uh, the real expectations uh, and uh, everything that can become an heritage of their culture. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry uh, if I've been so long. And then I say to all of our friends, uh, uh, this is linked to Italy, but if you see those are uh, all um, are aspects that can be can be present in any city of the world. Kipar, one of the major landscape architects in Europe and founder of Land, a, a, a project uh, agency uh, very important with a lot of, of, of projects. So, Andreas, I give you the floor, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Here we are. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you all. It's, uh, it's uh, really an honor. Uh, they asked me to, to speak in, uh, in Italian, so I can uh, switch well. in Italian. And, oh, oh, I don't want to lose uh, uh, too much uh, too much time, and uh, because I can you see my my, my screen? Hey. Can you see the presentation? You see. Okay, so uh, let me only uh, uh, show what. Oh, sorry, I need to go back so I can start. Uh, that is that is uh, Alora. I, I try to understand uh, what will be the language, but uh, there's a translation, so I, I want to switch to Italian. Okay. Okay. Uh, allora, quel tema uh, che ci sta occupando, io mi guardo un po' i tempi per non esagerare. Il tema è the topic we are dealing with is linked to the development to the landscape to architecture and nature these are topics of great interest landscape architecture nature and development these are our main topic topics in which we are working in many countries and landscape becomes central. We have a mission reconnecting people with nature. The topic of such dimension becomes very important, especially over these years called of the years of ecological transition. The green in the cities is linked to the scale, as Mr. Cellini said, the urban scale is very important. So the question is, why are we dealing with landscape? Because landscape represents the opposition between the efficiency generated by modernity and spirituality, slowness, reflection. We notice this change and this is linked to our important challenge is that we are living. We feel as main characters for the future. So this topic of uh, climate change that Jeremy um, Rifkins said, stop war on nature, becomes an indication because we have a responsibility towards these contemporary challenges. So white landscape, because 
the European Landscape Convention says that we are the landscape. So landscape is people oriented and this is important because it was said in the past first people and this dialogue does not it is very important and this is the extreme synthesis of the contemporary moments because 96% of the EU citizens ask for more responsibility for nature and it's a lot. This topic becomes important because uh, we need to understand how to take care of the landscape. We have to be conscious. We have to spread the education. And we have to go back to nature. And this is all the more true after the pandemic. This is not only a philosophical dimension or an ethical dimension, this becomes also an aesthetic dimension in nature. We started with green buildings and green infrastructures in Europe. We have many tools at our disposal. Ursula von der Leyen says that we have to bring nature back into our lives. And this topic concerning health and society brings us to a new Euro uh, European Bauhaus. I think that the president chose, has chosen the term of a new European Bauhaus because she couldn't find another term. It's no longer a matter of building we have to cultivate what we have and regenerate what we have. So this era is completely different from the emphasis of modernity of the 1920s. So we need to find a new term. We have thought of the five C's, namely knowledge, our projects are linked to the knowledge of what is present, of uh, the awareness of what we have, perseverance, cultivation, and prosperity, a continuous growth because nature doesn't stop. So we have to go back to our production landscapes and go back to their vocations of our cities. We have to learn from the territory and its vocation. That's why we need knowledge, patience, and we need to work with nature also in the territory for the new infrastructures. We have to create new approaches by including old landscapes, abandoned landscapes, become new focuses. They become sources of biodiversity and engineering infrastructures. In our projects, it is very important to have this be understood. This has become a place because this is nature which is accessible. 
in the topic you posed, we need to, to develop greener cities. We have to develop five minute cities. As you said, we are working in Dusseldorf, Essen, Milano, Cagliari, Vercelli. I don't want to go into details of every city, but this is the idea of Milan, the green race. The idea goes back to 2006, and I was asked to plant trees. This is very important. This structure, this architecture of plants grows. This is the dynamics that is very important with respect to the static nature of cities. For us, this is important because the fluidity is linked to a continuous process, such as here in the Milan Green Rays, there are attraction hubs with boulevards, with bypasses, and these by bypasses allow the city to become small neighborhoods. That's why we can find the human scale within the big city. These interventions become the skeleton of uh, an open space, which is different from 100 years ago. It requires a new structure, a new planning. This is the transformation of the areas that was made thanks to the other architects. This is the um, former Maserati uh, factory in Milan along the Lambro River. This has been transformed into a new urban landscape. So these are uh, daily places in which people, uh, which people use every day. So these are examples of transformation landscapes require a circularity and the holistic approach to landscape and to the urban drawing today opposes to the rationality of planning. But it adds value because it becomes a link within the urban tissue, creating spaces for the community, for meeting people, for leisure activities. I bring you some examples of green rays. In Essen, we started in 2017. The process is this one. Within the tissue, there will be spaces that will host specific areas, replacing, which will replace the old system. 
this will be enlightened and will highlight the circular path and the city from 2007 to 2020, we have created almost 500 projects within the urban tissue that have allowed to implement 35 kilometers of new bike lanes. This passage, this transformation is very important because you understand that the scale in the city of Essen is, is much more structured and becomes the basis, the foundation of a new era in which the relationship with soil and with society, with life, with the daily life, becomes very important and mandatory. As a green and blue infrastructure linked to water, to decontamination and to nature can express itself and become an engine for a further development. This is very important because Besides the temporary situation, it becomes a place in which we have, we are willing to take care of it. All the interventions around this landscape take into account what has been done. Another example is uh, Lugano or Sutirol. The plants change the the, the the various labels and the landscape becomes first. In Lugano, we have called this area the green grid. And there are various individual projects that become the focal points and the city is seen not only from the building uh, area, but the non-building areas. This becomes very important because we are realizing these projects at the moment, we are designing the executive design by taking into account all the multidisciplinary uh, subjects. We create places in which people can stay. And these places were not present in the past. These places can open themselves and become what we need, namely uh, areas that are lived in a more aware way. In this way, nature can assume other aspects. I'm very sorry, it is very interesting. I'm about to close. I have a, there's a problem with Zoom. So we need to uh, conclude. I close my speech 
this involves a lot of municipalities projections for uh, various cities, for example, Cagliari. And it is, these are not only drawings, but these are programs, uh, projects that allow us to govern a city which is different, which undergoes a transition. I don't want to enter into the details, but I want you to understand that we have to intervene at all scales, at the urban scale, as in Vercelli, Cagliari. And I close with this because we need, so I ask all presents, all participants, because we need to develop also the digital culture so that it can facilitate the knowledge of the territory because in this way we can make it visible and as Goethe said the eyes sees see what the mind knows already thank you i'm sorry well i am sorry you're very good. The, these presentations are very interesting. Unfortunately, we have a lot of limitations, but we will go more in depth because these projects are very, very interesting. So I want to reiterate this concept, the dynamic green not the static green. The projects are extraordinary and the green becomes more familiar. I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Anietzka Yatska. Please, uh, I am sorry, but I keep it short as much as possible. Please, you have the floor. Hello. Uh, can, you can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. Yes. Uh, okay. I share my I share my presentation. Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, uh, I am Agnieszka Jaszczak, and. Uh, um, I work at the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Valmia Mazur in Poland. And uh, today I would like to share with you some experiences um, uh, uh, in projects we uh, actually providing as a, as a department, me and my colleagues. And uh, those projects are, uh, fo are focused on uh, nature-based solution and also uh, on heritage and tradition. Uh, I would like to share uh, also some information about revitalization of public uh, space in, uh, in small cities, especially in Chita slow towns. And uh, 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 in our department, we of course do some research, but we also uh, our educational unit, so we work with students and uh, uh, our work with them uh, sometimes uh, also uh, uh, have this topic um, uh, about uh, nature-based solution in small, small towns, so it's very, very uh, uh, connected. And I am familiar with uh, Cheetah Slow organization uh, from the uh, very beginning. Uh, we started in 2003 a project uh, with a partner uh, in Umbria region. Uh, so, so I have also these this, uh, experiences in, in uh, uh, projects in Italy. And, uh, okay, so uh, let me start. Uh, we actually provide two, two projects, one uh, in a frame of coast action uh, Cycural City, and the second one is a bilateral project, uh, uh, LIVA, 
the concept of livability in the context of small towns. And we work together with university, uh, technolog technological university in Bratislava. And uh, uh, it's, as I said, it's bilateral project. And we uh, try to analyze some aspects of uh, revitalization uh, in a Polish Chita slow town, towns, as well as uh, in towns, small towns in uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, but uh, not belonging to the Chita slow uh, network uh, because they have a uh, Chita slow um, organization uh, so far, as I know. Uh, so this first action, this, this first project, uh, Psychora City, is an uh, interdisciplinary platform where, when, where we uh, uh, work with city planners, architects, and uh, designers, uh, engineers, and also researchers from social and natural sciences. And uh, we analyzing a different aspect of uh, uh, green in infrastructure or a nature-based solution in different scales. So from big cities uh, to the small towns, and uh, in the second project, uh, we focused mostly, as I said, in, uh, on small cities. And we are trying to, to, to do some analysis uh, in the context of livability. And uh, uh, we evaluate the potential of towns and uh, trying to prepare uh, guidelines for creation of friendly places to local communities. Uh, and uh, for us, the nature-based solutions, the green solutions, apply to modern approach uh, to designing of urban and also rural areas. And the green sol solutions are respond to ecological problems, of course, climate and spatial uh, changes in the countryside. And uh, of course, uh, they also uh, uh, they also uh, 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 are connected with uh, with recycling and uh, using a uh, 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 new form uh, with the with the with the old uh, patterns and the green solution also for us uh, should be environmentally friendly and uh, improve. Uh, the health of urban and rural residents, uh, so-called well-being. Uh, yes, and as I, as I uh, uh, told you, we have a different, um, a different topics. We, we focus on the social and cultural rule um, of greenery in the uh, Cheetah Sloan towns, and of course, revitalization of public spaces. And uh, uh, we work uh, on, on this topic um, uh, re uh, in research, but we also uh, are practitioners. So uh, we did a lot of uh, projects in uh, public spaces, in uh, uh, um, uh, main squares and uh, parks as well. Uh, for us, it's also important to, to analyze the use neighbor transport, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, also um, in a small towns, uh, especially in Poland. And uh, uh, we are uh, familiar with, uh, uh, with the topic of, um, uh, of um, soundscape as well. So different aspects, different topics uh, uh, in our research. Um, the next two projects are most focused on rural areas, but they are including also uh, uh, small towns. The first project is called uh, Smart Rural, and this international project, uh, 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 we work with seven uh, partners from uh, seven universities uh, in Europe. And uh, the, the second project uh, is also um, um, connected with uh, rural development and uh, smart rural and green solutions and called uh, rural youth. 
And we work, as I told you, uh, with students. Uh, actually, we uh, started to design in small, very, very small scale. Um, uh, we're trying to educate the people what is a, a, a green solution, what, what are the green solutions, and how uh, they can use uh, uh, also uh, these solutions in small towns. So, um, uh, uh, actually, we, we, we did some projects, uh, design works, um, uh, uh, in a case of uh, uh, modular small architecture, outdoor furniture in uh, villages con connected with small towns and uh, in small towns, uh, Chita slow towns uh, as well. So there are some, some examples how, how students work on this topic and they work of course with, with residents so it's uh, um, uh, also important to from from the city, small cities and villages, uh, to to be familiar with uh, with uh, nature based solution as well. Uh, we try also to 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 uh, to um, use the, the the historical or heritage path patterns in uh, such uh, proposals. So uh, there are different. The different uh, proposals uh, with different uh, solutions as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I would like uh, to conclude because I, I would like to be very, very fast. Uh, I would like to, to share with you a um, short movie. Uh, which, uh, which is uh, uh, connected with uh, this uh, uh, definition, nature-based solution. Um, uh, so I, I hope it's working. We can hear the video and unfortunately is very slow. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. You. So for that, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Nisha. And 
uh, the, 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 the last but not least uh, intervention of the, our dear friend, great Paul Knox, that you know as Professor Virginia Deck, but also the Atlas of City that is also in Italian, l'Atlanta delle Città. Paul, to you, the, the conclusion of this webinar. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks to all the uh, presenters today. Uh, I've learned a lot of some very interesting projects. Uh, you know, we ask an awful lot of planners and architects um, and landscape architects. We, we ask for efficient cities. We ask for equitable cities, sustainable cities. Um, and you've asked me to think about uh, urban design and social cohesion. Uh, so that's something else that, that we have to, uh, to consider. Uh, it's a challenge. Um, I know we are running just a little bit late. And so uh, if you'll uh, forgive me, I'm gonna share my screen and read a text. I think I can get through it in 10 or 11 minutes. Um, let me know. Can you see? Yes. Yes, anyway. good. Okay, uh, let me begin then. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in, in definitions but I think it's worth beginning with a few words about what we might mean by social cohesion. Uh, my background is in geography, and so I naturally tend to think of social cohesion in terms of the common experiences and understandings that are framed by place and locality. But as a social geographer, I also understand that a great deal of what matters in terms of social cohesion can't be influenced by urban design except at the margins. And I say this because the fundamental forces influencing social cohesion and the development of community are those of, first of all, congregation uh, as people of similar income, family status, and lifestyle preferences are drawn together. And secondly, segregation as people are forced together by discrimination and exclusion. So it's within these territorial frameworks that we typically find the density of secondary relationships uh, in social clubs, business associations, trade unions, political parties, pressure groups, sports clubs, volunteer groups, and so on, that generate the primary frameworks for social cohesion. But segregation and congregation can lead to social cultural and political bubbles, just like the social media bubbles that we've been hearing so much about recently. So what can urban design do? Ideally, it should facilitate social cohesion, not only within these broad territories of similar groups, but also between them. So for me, I guess like Tom and some of the rest of you, um, it's first of all a question of scale. Uh, the scale of the 15-minute city, uh, the scale of community planning. If social cohesion is underpinned by societal and citywide dynamics of congregation and segregation, and setting aside for the moment the influence of social media, we have to look to small-scale interventions that are relevant to people's day-to-day -day experience of place. Urban design is important because we know that there's a strong existential imperative for people to define themselves in relation to their material world as well as to each other. A useful concept here is that of the life world, the taken for granted pattern and context for living through which people conduct their day-to-day -day lives without having to make it an object of conscious attention. People's experience of everyday routines in familiar settings leads reflexively to a pool of shared meanings. People become familiar with one another's vocabulary, their speech patterns, dress codes, gestures and humor, and with shared experience of their physical environment. This is what makes for social cohesion and it's what urban design needs to encourage. So what I'm talking about here is intersubjectivity understandings that are derived from the lived experience of everyday practice. 
an important element of intersubjectivity and therefore an important consideration in urban design is the routinization of individual and social practice in time and space. Successful urban places not only have the lineaments of good urban form, but also an underlying rhythm of activity. In other words, successful urban design has got to foster what William White documented 40 years ago in his book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces. Routine encounters and shared experiences that build intersubjectivity. So among the attributes of successful places, we know we should expect to find plenty of opportunities for informal casual meetings and gossip, friendly bars and pubs, and a variety of settings in which to purchase or consume food, a variety of comfortable places to sit, wait, and people watch, all of which help to build a sense of belonging. Chitta slow principles, of course, speak directly to all of this. For some observers, it all adds up to the idea of livability. It's about how easy a place is to use and how safe it feels. It's about creating and maintaining a sense of place by creating an environment that is both inviting and enjoyable. Jan Gale is perhaps one of the most insightful writers in this context. He's shown that urban design can influence how many people use a city's public spaces, how long individual activities last, and which kinds of activities can flourish in different settings. He's shown that different interventions, different kinds of interventions are needed for different kinds of activities. And he distinguishes between necessary activities, such as shopping and going to work, optional activities, such as taking a stroll or top, stopping for a coffee at a cafe, and social activities, such as chance encounters, gossiping, storytelling, joking, flirtation, and serious conversation. We know all this works. Paradoxically, however, most new urban design projects are framed at a much larger scale. The product of public-private partnerships geared to the so-called experience economy or to flagship developments geared to inter-urban competitiveness. Their spaces are never genuinely public and they contribute very little to livability and nothing to social cohesion. In contemporary context, the High Line Park in New York City is often cited as illustrating the capacity of the design fields to successfully add to animation, conviviality, and sociability in public spaces with even a metropolitan setting. And it's inspired similar projects in other cities. But it's no coincidence that the High Line leads directly to Hudson Yards, one of the most glaring examples of urban design in the service of consumer-oriented spectacle rather than livability. Hudson Yards is a $25 billion, 12 hectare me mega project. I think this is the one that Tom was referring to earlier on. It's the largest private real estate development in US history, uh, albeit with $6 billion in state funding and tax breaks. Office towers and apartment buildings rise above a seven-story retail mall, all suspended above functioning railway tracks. The hallmark of the development is spectacle and grotesque luxury. With apartments priced at $25 million and more, stores offering overpriced watches and such, and a restaurant with a $1,000 tasting menu. Meanwhile, though, several schools of thought have emerged regarding the kind of urban design that is geared towards more towards everyday spaces and places. And we've heard about some of them this afternoon. Uh, green design, neo-traditional design, new urbanism, landscape urban urbanism, uh, and so on. Clearly not time to review them here, but I would note that they all seem vulnerable to intractable, intractable paradoxical situations. The American Planning Association, for example, designates what it calls great neighborhoods on the basis of having, quote, a true sense of place. 
The APA's checklist includes having mixed uses, multimodal transportation, visually interesting architectural features, a memorable character, evidence of community involvement, human contact and, and social activities. But as a result, APA accredited great neighborhoods tend to be somewhat stereotypical. They're middle class and upper middle class places, often in historic districts. They're not very affordable or socially or racially diverse. This example illustrates a central paradox in urban design. The more planners try to promote good physical design, the less affordable and therefore the less diverse the neighborhood seems to become. Good design is good for business, it seems, but not necessarily good for the goals of affordability, inclusiveness, and social diversity. Or one might add, social cohesion. This sense of frustration is one reason for the recent popularity of what has become known as tactical urbanism. That is activist or community led, short term, low cost, opportunistic interventions designed to improve life on a block by block, street by street basis. It's sometimes referred to as participatory urbanism or open source urbanism pop-up urbanism or do-it-yourself urbanism. It's not a new idea. Excuse me. Recent examples have involved reclaiming streets and repurposing them as parks, plazas, pop-up bicycle lanes, play streets, and even temporary community gardens. These are interventions at the kind of scale advocated by Jan Gale. Critics might regard them as pinpricks in the broader scheme of things, but its advocates claim that short-term actions will lead to long-term change. But there's a paradox here. Again, the sense of cool hipsterism propagated by tactical urbanism all too easily amounts to an invitation to gentrification. It also plays directly to the neoliberal creative city discourse, the prescriptive idea about the importance of attracting and retaining a so-called creative class of person that's held to be pivotal to innovation, economic vitality, and urban competitiveness. The implication is that if cities don't make strong efforts to establish the right ambience for creative workers, then they'll fall behind. Nevertheless, it is at the small scale addressed by tactical urbanism that urban design has the potential, I believe, to make the greatest difference. As Jan Gale points out, the design of individual spaces and the details down to the smallest components are the determining factors. The key here, I think, the bottom line is that people are attracted to other people and the capacity of the built environment to sustain animation conviviality and sociability in public spaces can be an important contribution to social cohesion, even if it's just at the margins. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. So uh, here we, we finish our webinar. I will remember that tomorrow will be Chitas Law Education Education at uh, 5 p.m. and uh, Friday 11 at 10 a.m. So uh, Cittas Road Tourism and Outdoor. I will thank to all. Uh, we, we, we had a, a good uh, uh, teams, the many teams uh, uh, to converge uh, on the idea of urban planning from uh, the general view of uh, as law uh, urbanism uh, to too practical uh, way to design uh, the the city in uh, relation with uh, heritage uh, uh, this idea for me wonderful of dynamic green that's something very new and uh, uh, the experiences also for poland 
and our great Paul Knox, the question of uh, social cohesion and people in the center of the city, people in the heart of Cittaslo. Thank you all. See you tomorrow for a new webinar. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Recording stopped.